For those of you getting ready for the PMP exam, you've probably heard that the PMBOK Guide 7th edition is referred to quite a lot these days. But what exactly is in the 7th edition and what are some of the overarching ideas about it? The first overarching idea is project management definitions. What exactly is project management? Back in the day, we used to say that project management is the application of knowledge and skills, tools and techniques to project activities to deliver a unique product, service, or result, known as a deliverable. Well, in the seventh edition, the PMI Go is a step further. Not only do we have the deliverable, but we have the understanding of what the deliverable actually does for the client, what it does for the customer, what it does for the stakeholder. It adds something of relevance, something of benefit to the customer. So the customer experiences different benefits from that deliverable, that product, service, or result. Now, when you get the aggregate of all those benefits, we call it value. In fact, the PMI define value as the net quantifiable benefits that a user derives from a product, service, or result. In this case, the cake. But not only that, in the seventh edition, we go a step further to accentuate that it's not just about the deliverable or the benefits or the value, but it's all about the final outcome. And that outcome could be one of customer satisfaction. It could be one of efficiencies and effectiveness that the customer actually wants to see. And this idea, my friends, takes us into another overarching change in the seventh edition. It's one that has kept many people awake and it's, Phil, do I need to read the entire seventh edition? No, 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 no. Right now, there's no need for you to do that, but there's certain things you need to pay attention to and certain things you need to know about. And that's why I would like to refer you to a couple of links. I'd like you to go on to tinyurl.com forward slash PMBOK domains. And I would also like you to go to the website tinyurl.com forward slash PMBOK principles. Why? Because right now we're about to dive into these principles and domains. So taking a look at the principles, right here on the screen, you can see that we have 12 of these principles. We're going to tackle them one by one. The very first one is stewardship. Let's max the page so we can see it without having to strain our eyes. You can see here it reads, stewards act responsibly to carry out activities with integrity, care, and trustworthiness while maintaining compliance with internal and external guidelines. Not only are you serving, you are also being aware of compliance and the ramifications of compliance to your firm. You're going to act responsibly. You're going to act in a trustworthy manner. A holistic view of stewardship considers financial social, technical, and sustainable environmental awareness. It's not just about what has been entrusted to you. It goes above that into ensuring you are complying with rules, regulations, and relevant governance. The next one is team. Project teams are made up of individuals who wield diverse skills, knowledge, and experience. The bottom line about this, you need to form this environment of collaboration. You need to understand that teams need the environment and support to get the job done. The next one is stakeholders. Engage stakeholders proactively. Now, when you take a look at this, you're going to see parallels with the Agile Manifesto. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. It says project teams serve other stakeholders by engaging with them. You know, the Agile Manifesto says Business people and developers should work together daily throughout the project. It's that same mindset. The next one is value. It says continually evaluate and adjust project alignment to business objectives and intended benefits and value. It says value is the ultimate indicator of project success. I like that because it says working product is a primary measure of progress. Very similar. Also in the Agile Manifesto, when we take a look at this, it says that you should be delivering product to your customer frequently, right? A couple of weeks to a couple of months with preference to the shorter time scale. 
So it says here, going back to what I said in the very beginning, the second bullet from the bottom, it says, a focus on outcome allows project teams to support the intended benefits. You see that word there? These are things you need to be familiar with for your exam. The next one is systems thinking. Seeing the big picture, it says, recognize, evaluate, and respond to dynamic circumstances. What's this talking about? It's just saying be agile. You got to see the big picture and then you got to be agile because the environment is always changing. The playing field is always changing. Being responsive to system interactions allows the project teams to leverage positive outcomes. Next, let's move into leadership. My mentor, John Maxwell, says everything rises and falls on leadership. And that's true, even being great at project management. The PMI did some research and they show in their book that the top 2% of project managers is voted by their colleagues, their bosses and peers. It says they are those with superior interrelationship skills and great leadership. So leaders demonstrate desired behavior in areas of honesty, integrity, and ethical conduct. Leadership is different than authority. Authority is your starting position. But in order to effectively lead, you've got to lead with more than just authority alone. The next one is tailoring. This is common sense to those who understand how frameworks work. The PMBOK guide is a framework. You're not meant to robotically apply to every single project. So all this is saying is each project is unique. Tailor your processes, your approach to your project. That's the summary. The next one is quality. Lots of you have read the quality chapter in the sixth edition. Well, this is no different. It's only calling your attention to focus on quality. Produce deliverables that meet project objectives. It says project quality entails satisfying stakeholder expectations and fulfilling project and product requirements. Quality focuses on meeting acceptance criteria for deliverables. Project quality entails ensuring project processes are appropriate and are as effective as possible. So this goes hand in hand with the topic of tailoring, the topic of scope. You want to effectively scope out so you're doing the right stuff. The next one is complexity. And this just makes sense because if you're trying to be agile and you're trying to adapt and pivot, you should be ready for complex environments. That's what agile is kitted for. So you got to continuously evaluate and navigate project complexity so that approaches and plans enable the project team to successfully navigate the project lifecycle. Complexity is as a result of human behavior, system interactions, uncertainty, and ambiguity. And complexity can emerge at any point during the project. Let's talk about what complexity is in a more vivid format. I want you to think about an x-axis and a y-axis. On the y-axis, what you have there is requirements uncertainty. You have requirements ambiguity. On the x-axis, you have technical process. And you have ambiguity around that technical process. Now, where you have a high level of uncertainty in the requirements and of the technicality, you're going to be getting into complex mode pretty quick. And all this is saying is complexity can emerge at any point. It can be introduced by events or conditions that affect value, scope, communications, stakeholder, risk, and technological innovation. Things can become complex pretty quick. Once there's certain clarifying information to help you really understand where you stand on a continuum of understanding and you realize, oh my goodness, I thought I knew. Well, I guess I don't right now because this information is telling me we don't know diddly squat about what's being done. We have a long way to go. You see, complexity can suddenly become apparent and that's what PMI is trying to say. And they're trying to say you've got to continually evaluate that complexity level so that your approaches and your plans can fit the bill. The next one is risk. We already know what risk is. Risk is an uncertain event that could impact your project positively or negatively. And all it's saying is be aware of risks, positive risks, opportunities, negative risk threats. Assess them all throughout the project. An organization's risk attitude, appetite, and threshold influence how risk is addressed. Risk responses should be appropriate, 
for the significance of the risk, cost-effective, realistic, agreed, and owned. What they're saying, in essence, is choose the best mousetrap for that risk. Adaptability and resiliency is next. Being adaptable is really about being agile. Being resilient is really about having staying power in the face of adversity. All this is saying is have bounce back ability. That's a word I made. <laughs> you got to have bounce back ability. You got to build adaptability and resiliency into the organization's and project team's approach to help the project accommodate change. Adaptability is the ability to respond to changing conditions, to pivot when you need to. Resiliency is the ability to absorb impacts and to recover quickly, to get up. It's like Arnold as a Terminator. That creature had some resiliency. But anyway, a focus on outcomes rather than outputs facilitates adaptability. Keep your eye on the outcome. Again, that word outcome. Remember in the very beginning, I showed you that image. And what did I say about the image? I said, ultimately, your stakeholder doesn't just want a deliverable. They don't just want benefits and value alone. They want a desired outcome. And it's your job as a project manager to know, oh, this is what the customer wants. This is the outcome they're seeking. Let me get to it. So my friends, we have one final one and it's change. Again, very agile in nature. In fact, if you take a look at everything on this page, my friends, you'll see that it's all agile in nature. Prepare those impacted for the adoption and sustainment of new and different behaviors and processes required for the transition from the current state to the intended future state created by project outcomes. It's a no-brainer. If you're taking your company through change, Shouldn't you prepare the entire organization for the change? Shouldn't you equip them? Because attempting too much change in short times can lead to change fatigue and or resistance. I know this firsthand company I was in was trying to implement SAP. Well, not implement, force SAP on people. And the poor people didn't like it. And management got mad. Very poor change management. All this is saying is think about change management. For those of you just coming, we're talking about PMBOK Guide 7th edition. I wanted to clear up some of the misnomers. Some people think, oh, woe is me, I'm going to fail the exam if I don't read the 7th. Well, there are a lot of people who are getting 80, 80, 80, and they did not read the 7th. Now, I'm not saying it's not part of your ethical professional obligations to read the 7th, form an opinion about it, know what's in it, so that when the 8th is on the way, you'll be more instrumental and valuable to the PMI and the community by giving a critique about whether that is a great way to proceed or whether there are opportunities in the 8th. I'm looking forward to the 8th. I don't know what they've got planned, but I know what I'm expecting. You need to have an opinion. Those of you who missed it in the very beginning, go on down to tinyurl.com forward slash PMBOK domains. Also go on down to tinyurl.com forward slash PMBOK principles. I want you to download these free tools. Totally free. The next tool we're going to look at is the project performance domains. What exactly is a performance domain? Well, as it says on the screen here, performance domain is defined as a group of related activities that are critical for the effective delivery of project outcomes. Note what it said. It's a group of activities. It's not a group of knowledge areas or a group of processes. It is a group of activities. And that means there's a potpourri of activities that could throw you off if you're looking for knowledge areas or process groups, because it's not about that. It's groupings for that reason. Group of related activities critical for the effective delivery. We're focusing on delivery of project outcomes. Okay? So I would like to look at this as complementary to what you already know. Okay? It starts off at 12 o'clock right here. And when I say 12 o'clock, I'm talking about at the top with stakeholder. What exactly is this about? Well, we've already implicitly touched on this today. It says the stakeholder performance domain addresses activities and functions associated with stakeholders. It's stuff you already know. It says effective stakeholder interaction contributes 
to successful project outcomes. Stakeholder engagement includes implementing strategies and actions to promote productive involvement of stakeholders in project decision making and implementation. It's another spin on chapter 13 with emphasis on activities that are going to help, read what it says, contribute to successful project outcomes. Your mindset, this is another mindset thing. The mindset is on stakeholder interaction for the right outcome. It's that simple. Let's go to the next one. Moving in clockwise order. Let's go to one o'clock. The team performance domain. And for those of you just come in, I would appreciate if you hit that like button, subscribe, look for these documents. Someone says, Phil, where are the documents you mentioned right here, tinyurl.com forward slash PMBOK principles. Right now we're on the domains. So this is the one you want, okay? Great, all right. So the project team performance domain addresses activities and functions associated with the people who are responsible for producing project deliverables that realize business outcomes. Watch that word. So we already know who the team is, the individuals who are doing the work. We call them the developers in the world of Scrum. We call them team in the world of Agile. An environment can be established to support the team in evolving into a high-performing team, bursting through, forming, storming, norming, performing, adjourning, going through those five levels, and hopefully not having to adjourn, but staying in the performing stage. Why do you want the team to disband? After all that work and equity, are you kidding? You don't want your team to disband. You want to keep them together. So the idea is to support the team, support the team to evolve. And once they've evolved keep them in that position, give them the environment and support they need, give them the encouragement, give them the autonomy. That's what this is saying. Let's go to three o'clock. Three o'clock, it says development approach and life cycle. If you've read the Agile Practice Guide, page 18, 19, 14, you already know this story. It says, the development approach and life cycle performance domain addresses activities and functions associated with the development approach, cadence, and life cycle phases of the project. Am I going to be iterative, incremental? Am I going to be agile? Am I going to be predictive? What am I? Well, it says, determine the most appropriate development approach based on the deliverable, whether it's predictive, adaptive, or even hybrid. The deliverables and the development approach influence the number and cadence for project deliveries. Think about that. And then it goes further to say the development approach and delivery cadence influence the project life cycle and its phases. So you need to be all over understanding what cadence means, what that rhythm means, why you're doing it to a one week or one day cadence, why the work is being released as far out as two months in some instances, why not one month? All of those things become clearer in this domain. Let's go on to four o'clock planning. If you've read everything on that dreaded page 25, the 224, 10, 12, 1, you kidding? You know this stuff. This is all about the functions associated with the evolving organization and coordination for delivering the outcomes. It's all about the outcomes. You see that word here? the spin on all these definitions, a couple of things, you're going to see delivery and you're going to see outcomes. So in your mind, planning is how do we plan for effective delivery and outcomes? Now I've given you the template. Boom! It's going to work for all the other domains as you hear them. Project work is all about understanding the activities for the delivery and the outcome. But this project work performance domain cuts pretty close to a number of places like scope and quality. And it says project work includes communication engagement, managing physical resources, procurements, and other work to keep project operations running smoothly. It's that simple. Delivery, need I say more? 
This is about the delivery itself. So again, deliverance scope and quality. You see there's this running theme. There's this thread of quality all through this. And there's this thread of scope because how can you deliver if you don't deliver the right scope of deliverable or of increment? So all throughout, there's a theme of doing what the customer needs, the value the customer expects, the level of quality the customer is looking for. It's all impacted. We also here talk about suboptimal projects. Suboptimal projects are to be expected. It's okay if you had a less than ideal outcome, but what are you doing to learn from that lesson is the question. Nine o'clock, we have measurement. This is one of my favorites. Don't measure for measuring's sake. Ask yourself, why are we measuring this? And use the five whys. Ask yourself five times, why do we want that metric? For what reason do we want that? Why? Why? Five times. You may realize that the metric being asked for is a vanity metric. The metric being asked for is inherently useless. It shows data, but the data is meaningless or useless. I like this domain because it sensitizes the project manager to measuring the right stuff at the right time. It says here, the measurement performance domain evaluates the degree to which the project deliveries and performance are meeting intended outcomes. So that means in economies of scale, we need to have our benefits register. We need to have our benefits plan. We need to understand very clearly all the benefits. Because remember, the net quantifiable benefits is the value that we talk about all the time. And then you need to understand the implication of delivering that value to give the outcome. The outcome may not necessarily be we want a new CRM tool. No. It could be you want to see certain efficiencies as a result of using that tool. You want to see a turnaround. You want to see the customer engagement go up. It's not about the tool. It's not about people just finding benefit in-house from the tool. It's about the outcome that you want to see from that tool an increase, a 70% increase in customer engagement, an 80% increase in customer conversion. Those are the outcomes we're talking about. Moving on to uncertainty, 10 o'clock. Uncertainty is this aspect of threats and opportunities yet again from a risk lens. Because after all, risk is uncertainty that matters, as my buddy the Risk Doctor would say. And if you haven't subscribed to his channel, you want to look for the Risk Doctor channel, you can learn a ton from him. But it says, projects exist in environments with varying degrees of uncertainty, varying degrees of risk. And when we say uncertainty, you got to make sure you're not just thinking negative, you're also thinking potentially positive as well. Uncertainty in the broadest sense, though, is a state of not knowing or unpredictability. There are many nuances to uncertainty, such as risk associated with not knowing future events. Body the risk doctor will refer to this as a black swan event. Ambiguity associated with not being aware of current or future conditions. Complexity associated with dynamic systems and unpredictable outcomes and many others. And you as a good project manager, you should have your way of dealing with uncertainty. You can only do so much. You don't have a crystal ball to know the crazy stuff that was about to happen in the world. But what you do have is a ready team, and you can always get a workaround. And a workaround is an unplanned response to an event that was not conceived ever before. You could also see a workaround is an unplanned response to a risk whose original response was not effective. But that is beyond the scope of the guide. We have gone through, my friends, these domains, stakeholder team, development approach and life cycle, planning, project work, delivery, measurement, uncertainty, and we're back to the beginning. If you found value from this,
Don't forget to hit like, subscribe. Remember, everything on the PMP exam is a mindset. Largely, the drag and drops, yes, I know some of those are there. The hotspots, yes, I know some of those are there. But when you boil it all down, it's going to come back to one thing <laughs> and one thing only. And you know what that thing is? What should the project manager do mm -hmm, next? What should the PM do next? That's the question. Okay? For those of my friends who are like, Phil, quite enjoyed it. How do I sign up for training, coaching with you? Just go on down to our website. It's called praiseon.com, P-R-A-I-Z-I-O-N.com. Take a look at some of the programs we've got going on. PMP, ACP, CAPM. Maybe you're PMP and you want a little bit extra like Microsoft Project or scaling of Agile, user story mapping. There's so many options. Take a look at the website. If you got any questions, put them in the comments below. Thank you, my friends. I wish you all the best as you prepare. Take care and bye for now.